record, which I always forget. There we go. Uh, <laughs> so there's the recording, and I hope everybody's okay with that, the, the, the fact that we're actually uh, recording the, the session. And uh, that's great. So look, we, we are going to get started in a few minutes because we have three sets of speakers uh, today, not two as usual, three sets of speakers. So we've added a little bit more time and um, they, they're, they're coming from all over the world and from various different time zones. So it's, it, it's quite something uh, to be honest with you. So look, let me give you a quick run through of who's with us today. So first of all, we've got uh, Terence Gunning and Owen Sadlier from the VHI. Um, and most people in Ireland uh, will know uh, the VHI because it's been around for a very long time and it is still the biggest uh, health insurance company in the country uh, with over 1.2 million customers right so that's a lot of people to look after and a lot of data to analyze and visualize and so uh, Terence and Owen are going to do a joint presentation uh, and they're going to be looking at how they I suppose optimized business performance through crisis, and that crisis, of course, was that was was COVID nineteen, uh, which we're all still dealing with. Um, some of us more than others, uh, because our next speaker, uh, Ella Warsdale, is uh, from the Peak District, uh, is coming to us from the Peak District in in the north of England, where I, I believe the pubs are open. I, I saw some pictures coming in from England the other day. Uh, of, of people sitting down in pubs having pints. Uh, we're not at that juncture yet in Ireland, but uh, we, we will be soon. Uh, but I'm delighted to have Ella along. And uh, really, when I was putting this together um, with the, uh, you know, the topic of healthcare in mind, I uh, really wanted someone from the NHS along, okay? Um, because I just kind of feel that uh, it is a great organization all right and i'll stop there <laughs> and hopefully let ella uh, do more of the talking but 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 really ella's been trying to build a data-driven culture across the nhs and and the main reason she's she's been doing that is ultimately because she wants to benefit patients and and uh, get outcomes for patients that are based on real uh, that are based on real evidence based decisions, basically. Right. And so I think it's great to have her along. I'm really looking forward to that presentation. She's been a group ambassador since the uh, Tableau user group ambassador since the summer of 2019. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to hearing from her. Uh, Ella, what is the uh, uh, very basic question, but what is the weather like over there today? <laughs> uh, it's grey and miserable. Like grey and miserable. The north of England. The north of England. What more could you ask for? Absolutely fantastic. That's great. Okay. And somewhere where the sun hasn't even come up yet. Uh, and, and I think it's exceptional, uh, really, uh, that th these people have joined us today is in Chicago. Uh, Mark Connolly and Louise Heelan uh, are joining us from U Chicago Medicine. And look, I, I, I have to say, I am really so delighted to have them along. It's uh, it's 20 past five in the morning over there and these guys are getting up to present to us now I believe if you look at Mark Connolly the the, the surname is is rather Irish so I used that uh, to to emotionally blackmail him into giving us a, a presentation at five o'clock this morning uh, his time and, and it worked I'm glad to say uh, Louise Heelan's connection to Ireland is a little bit stronger would you believe she was actually born in Dublin um, but you, you won't get that from her accent because she's been uh, living abroad for quite a few years. Um, Louise, were you, I think you told us earlier, you were six when you moved to Canada originally, is that okay. right? Yep, yep. Okay. I was six when I moved to Canada. So. Six when she moved to Canada, and, and uh, but I'm sure you've been back to Dublin a few times since, have you? Many times. All of my family stayed there, so ah, yeah. brilliant. Okay. frequent Great. visitor. Okay, great stuff. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so what they're going to talk us through how you Chicago Medicine use Tableau in their response to COVID as well. And look, I've seen some of, of, of uh, well, some material, shall we say, on this before. I think it was featured on the Tableau site itself. And uh, it's really impressive. So um, look, I'm looking forward to, to all of the presentations and, and they should be it should be a really good uh, user group. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. So look, we're, we're on time. It's 20 past 11. Uh, we have a good few participants uh, who joined us now at this stage. Um, so I think without further ado, if it's all right with uh, everybody, I am going to get this party started, as they say. 
And I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Terence and Owen, uh, who will start their presentation. I'll ask the rest of us then to just uh, go on mute and to stop our videos and uh, enjoy the Tableau user group, guys. Great. Uh, thanks, Johnny. Um, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to get the opportunity today to present. Uh, myself and Owen have been, we've been a fairly regular attendees of these user groups um, since we got Tableau over the last few years and delighted to be presenting for the first time. Um, so, so we're going to bring you through our relatively short Tableau journey. Um, and, and then we're going to focus on the key piece of work that, that has really made Tableau mainstream in VHI. Um, and it came about last year due to the COVID-19 crisis. And we're going to talk through some of the, the, the technical challenges we had and, and what we did to overcome um, to, to them to achieve it. So just start off with some housekeeping. Um, I'm Terence. I, I, I'm an accountant with my background. I head up the FBA team in VHI. We're, we're principally responsible for all of the finance projections that the business produce. So from setting budget strategy, uh, reforecasting, and projecting for pricing and, and, and various regulatory submissions. And we've had a very busy 14 months, obviously, over the last uh, 14 months with, with, with COVID and how to kind of manage through that. Um, I'm also responsible for the, the timely analysis and reporting of management information, which focuses on the key operational dynamics across the business. Um, and both of these tasks require a lot of technical work. So we, we build financial models and we build out reporting systems using the Excel, VBA, SQL, PLSQL, ASP.NET, a lot of technologies there over the years. And bringing a Tableau in now on top of that, all, all that into our roles has been a very natural progression and it's brought about a lot of efficiencies and a lot of value. Yeah, so um, I'm, uh, I'm Owen Sadler. Uh, I'm the data partner with the FBNA team. Um, and I suppose my, my role would be um, I suppose working with the team to source the data, to feed them the data, um, and also to work with the wider wider partners uh, across the company to um, ensure that we get uh, their data into us and help them with their data as well. So, uh, and furthermore, I suppose to be working with IT to, um, to 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 facilitate all that as well. Um, so that's that's me. Cool. So just a bit of housekeeping, the, 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 the VHI, a quick background, especially for international guests. Um, it's, it's a health insurance company, uh, first and foremost. We have, fair, we, we, we have um, broadened out further than that. Um, it is the largest health insurance company in Ireland and the largest Irish-owned insurance company. We pay out over 1.4 billion in claims each year. Now, obviously, with, with COVID last year, that, that came down a bit, but in the normal kind of run, run rate. Um, and to give some context, this compares to about I think the, the general insurance market, the entire general insurance market in Ireland pays about three billion and um, spread across 25 companies. So, so just the kind of context there, we're, we're, we're rather large. Um, and it, the health insurance market in Ireland, it, it's be different to the to like UK or the, the US. Um, the Irish population is about 4.9 million, just under half of the population have health insurance. So it's, it's split down the middle and we have about half of the market. So um, about a quarter of the Irish population is a member of VHI. Um, whereas in the UK, only about ten percent, I understand, of health insurance, and the USA, about ninety percent of health insurance. So, so Ireland's a bit of a hybrid in between the two. And in terms of the broader business, as well as health insurance, we also sell dental insurance, travel insurance, life insurance, international health insurance, and we have healthcare provision arm, health and wellbeing. We provide minor injury treatments in our swift care clinics. Uh, we have hospital home service. We have nurse line call center. We have a online doctor where you can visit your GP over, over a webinar, um, screening clinics and, and corporate events like park runs and the list goes on. And I'm not trying to sell you anything here, um, to, even though our products are quite competitively priced, but the idea is just to give you a good flavor for like, a broad range of business lines and operations in VHI group and our team reports on all of them um, regularly. So, so we all know what happened uh, last March, um, like every other business on the planet, VHI was impacted severely by COVID-19 um, and our management needed to understand quickly what the impacts of COVID would be on the entire business. There was a broad range of impacts across the business for various different reasons. So um, in terms of affordability cash flows, there was a lot of talk early last year about recessions and economic downturns, which was a real concern for health insurance. Um, some context like post 2008, the health insurance market in Ireland declined by about 10%. So, so, so employment, affordability, cash flows were very important to understand. So we need to keep an eye on all of that. And um, in terms of our claims line, um, so the public hospital network was actually closed for three months. The, pub the public system took it over. So, so all of the private hospitals were 
the majority of our, our claims payout would be we're just shut down. So there's no claims for three months. And we need to understand what, what the impact of that would be. Um, and then with lockdowns and flights being grounded, how would our travel insurance or international policy perform? Um, or the GP offices were closed, dentists were closed for, for, for during the first lockdown. And then even our own healthcare provision, so access to our SIF care clinics were considerably limited. Um, and other, other our, our, our screening clinics were shut down. So, so and big, big impact across the business, even the financial market. So like any insurance company, our BHI is a big um, investment asset over a billion in invest, investment. So we needed to keep an eye on what was happening there in the markets um, and how with our relatively large workforce, we have over a thousand members and um, that's our staff, uh, we're office staff, and how would they adapt to, to working from home? So managers needed a comprehensive understanding of how the entire business was going to perform um, it needed a clear view of the business and, and it needed to be delivered concisely, promptly and frequently. So FBA, um, as, is our, as is our role, as is our job, we were asked to prepare this report really as soon as possible, like within days. So, so, so we, we opted for the best tool we had. So, so we introduced Tableau to three, into VHI three years ago. Um, a cross-functional team, which, which myself and owner part of, we went through a detailed selection process. And there was a few other products we looked at and Tableau came out the clear winner. Um, there was a, initially a lot of interest in Tableau in the organization and many people trained across the business. However, the, the first year or so, there was some excellent reports produced and really good pieces of work. Um, they were in the kind of more niche specific use case. So didn't really get the kind of general um, exposure that, that that kind of deserved. Um, we had an initial Tableau community set up and we've working well together, driving it that got a culture, but, but, but progress had been slow. The, the legacy report systems are still the go-to for the business, and, and there was no big drive towards any significant change there. Um, in our own FBNA team, a bit more autonomy, so we had migrated our monthly reporting pack, and we had a classic Excel combo, and we translated that into, into Tableau. So through that, we had learned quite a bit about the, the most efficient ways to optimize the data feeds. Um, so when it came to, to, to turn around something quickly last year, this gave us, we had the necessary knowledge, experience and, and, and agility um, to produce what was required to guide the business through through COVID. And this really has been the catalyst for driving the change, the change in mindset and the change to approach to data in VHI. So, so uh, now is gonna bring you through some of the, the challenges, the technical challenges we had and, and, and the solutions we've come up with to overcome them. Yeah, so um, as they were saying, uh, we, we had been on, on the data journey for, for two years uh, with Tableau. Uh, we had been creating uh, ad hoc reports at times and uh, other times sort of developing sort of one-off reports that would then refresh themselves and maintain going forward. Um, so, so we had a bit of, bit of knowledge uh, in that and, and, and those kind of reports we were amalgamating into our, our monthly MI packs. Um, so, so, but we had the leisure there of having a whole month to turn it around, uh, to gather and collate that, that data and the one-off pieces well that was exactly where they were one off and then they were discarded so and move on to the next next month whereas now we had the requirement to have a, a full deck of of everything that was going on in the business being uh, updated on a weekly basis and given that the data was coming to a so late it wasn't really we didn't have a week to do it we had hours to do it uh, every week <clears throat> uh, and so there was many challenges around that um uh, uh, on top of that obviously there was many contributors we had uh, our own team of 10 people um but as well as that they were all our our, our stakeholders and partners uh, throughout the business feeding into us uh data and that data was arriving to us in, in a, a range of, of of ways um so there was the, the the nicely curated uh data warehouse operational data store data that our uh, data team would have prepared for us uh, historically and all along which uh, w w was very nice and handy for us to to, to, to delve into uh, for, for the ones that were already curated but then it ranged all the way down to spreadsheets and emails with a few numbers that we needed to, to represent within within this report and so that was that was quite quite challenging uh, and that sort of broke down into two separate sort of groups of data as I said there was the, the known and previously handled ones that we would have done in our monthly MI pack. And then there was those fresh pieces of information that were required uh, in this overview that, that hadn't been curated before uh, by ourselves. So, um, uh, and all that then, as I say, needed to be turned around in the matter of, of a couple of hours. So, <clears throat> um, I say there was the pack itself, uh, it, you know, it, it consisted uh, 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 of in and around 40 different sheets in Tableau. Um, and initially, 
um, behind those sheets, there was 16, uh, I think it was data sources. Um, now, many of those are multiple instances of the same one. So there was actually only three unique uh, data sources uh, that we were using. Uh, and that sort of stems from, from the solution we came up with, uh, which was around using an upload facility, uh, which I'll get into more detail now uh, shortly. Um, but um, the, the, uh, as, as well as that, not, not only do we have all those data sources or, or, or the challenge of having all those data sources is that, you know, all the filtering, all the, all the fixing of those, th those, um, so there's a couple of simple things, obvious things maybe to, to, to tableau heads um, that we, we did. So for filtering each of the sheets and, uh, you know, uh, we just put in one parameter that drove every single sheet. So the, the report itself is a, a five week running view. So what were the last five weeks like this year and what were the last five weeks like in the prior year? Um, and so we, we just created one ta one parameter that you updated and that, that filtered all, all the sheets. So that worked really well from a, 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 an automation sort of perspective. Um, the Obviously the, the well curated data sources, they were refreshing as they went along. But the problem we had was with the, uh, the, the uncurated uh, data that we needed to to, to to handle. So we were looking at the potential for a, a, a quite messy uh, vista for ourselves of managing all this disparate pieces of information coming in, um, maintain them all in separate little data sources. Uh, and I could see that we were going to start building tens and hundreds and more data sources that somehow we were going to have to maintain and roll forwards. Um, and while the report itself uh, at the top level would look nice and pretty for the users, we, we were really going to be in a tangle trying to get it, get it sorted um, on a week by week basis. So we went ahead and, and I suppose fell back, uh, went ahead and <laughs> fell back and leveraged um, the, the knowledge that, that we had or the experience we'd had previously with, with VBA and, and the SQL and, and macros and that kind of stuff. So we were we, we came to the conclusion that all the data, all the uncurated, uncurated data that we were going to source should fit into one shape, uh, one table that was going to have 10 columns in it and that we, we could provide all of the people that were feeding into us with a, an Excel or a macro enabled Excel that would load into this table. So we'd had a bit of, um, you know, work with, with our, our stakeholders to uh, talk them through the process and, and very quickly everyone understood. Your first column is just what your data source is. So is it government COVID data? Is it claims data? Uh, is it, or summarized claim data? Is it um, complaints data? And, and so that would be your, your, your filter for the data source. And then you'd have all the different, uh, you know, three columns for, for dimension type of information, a measure inf a column, a date column. And so th there was many benefits to that in that suddenly instead of having hundreds of data sources potentially that it, I'd have to be managing it on the server, there was one, there was only one data source that I needed to ma manage. And on top of that, then all the users that were going to pick up that data source, uh, while uh, it, it, it might be a bit constrictive, they all always knew this is the shape of the data I'm getting when they picked it up on, on the server. And all I need to know is what to filter in the uh, in, in the data item column. So I'm going to filter for complaints data, and then I understand what the rest of the columns are giving me. Now, yes, when, when they were picking up those data sources, there was maybe a little bit of work to be done in renaming fields, putting in a few calculated uh, uh, fields beyond that. But really, it simplified our process greatly and meant that every week, uh, users around the business were able to just load up the data through the Excel and it was there available for us uh, within within our report. And not only was it available for us within the report, um, because the parameter uh, that we'd already instigated was controlling it all, it all just rolled over automatically. Um, so they did the load, parameter was in place, and the data was uh, th there ready to go uh, for, for the fresh week. Um, so I think um, I, we might hand over to Ter just to start talking about the actual report itself and the content. Yeah, so so that solution gave us gave us the kind of agility to get the data flowed right through and, and I'd say very dynamic and very streamlined. Um, in terms of the report then, I have it on the right, obviously there's commercially sensitive uh, information, we can't kind of show too much detail, but it, that's kind of the shape and the look of it. Um, so, so the four key principles we stuck to, they need to be concise. So we decided early on that 
given there was so much happening this time or this time last year, even earlier as March, um, the, the 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 senior leaders need to understand very quickly what was going on. So it needed to be something to be glanced down at. You didn't want to be going through pages and pages of data. So it needs to be something very punchy and, and that would bring the focus to the key areas. Um, so, so I had that focus to, to, to bring in the key items that needed attention. It was dynamic, so the content was changed a hundred times. So, 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 so it was very different product now to what it was a year ago, different items were looked at. Um, so as new items came into focus, we'd, ask, we'd get asked to report on them to bring them in, to look at them weekly, and other items become less interesting, they, they, they dropped off. And it needs to be frequent, so it was sent out every Monday evening. So we had a very quick turnaround between getting, pulling the data together first thing Monday and getting out Monday evening to the, to, to the management to, to, to guide them in the week ahead. So that the dynamic stuff Owen spoke about there in terms of solution helped us do that. Um, so we didn't have to wait around for, for, for data. So just in terms of the details report, um, the next slide there. So the, 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 the content, so it's kind of split up into about five or six sections. So the top section is, is actually public data. So we can show you that and that gives you a good flavor of what the kind of detail was. So, so the, the, the COVID data on the top, um, attracted key items that you can see in the snapshot at the top there. Like so, some of these changed over time. So, for example, the vaccination data is obviously relatively new, um, and, and, and the, the the incidence rate there by county is relatively new. And we have been tracking other items such like COVID patients and public hospitals data. So, that was actually a very useful lead indicator for for predicting claims and, and, and claims utilization in hospitals. So, so so as things came more interesting, that they they they, they, uh, they came in and, and were taken out. For, for membership, um, obviously one of our key kind of metrics. So we, we track cancellations by uh, or sales by products. Um, so health insurance, but so but for each product, so health insurance, dental or travel. Um, and given the initial concern, memberships actually proved rather resilient. Um, so we think like the major job losses in, 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 this, in the economy weren't in the sectors that usually purchase health insurance. Um, and, and possibly there has been some sentiment that obviously in a health crisis, people value their health cover more. So, so people might have signed up for that. And ultimately, we did see that the health insurance market grow um, over 2020, and it continues to grow into Q1 2021. Um, however, obviously, with the with the decline in tourism, we 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 did see a decline in, in our travel and travel membership and travel market. Um, on the claim side, there was significant impacts to pay out. So, so as I said earlier, the the hospitals closed for three months. So, especially in those months, and um, in our report, we had to track all of that, what was going on in each hospital, what by by week, by month, um, and the impacts were so significant we had to react um, and ultimately we did pay back a lot of the premiums for those months uh, we didn't have to pay for the, for the, for the claims for those months um, in terms of operations so staff moving working from home now we've over say over a thousand office staff so a lot of call center staff and um, they had to uh, move back home it's very important to track the, the call volumes and the service level quality performance and, and, and staff to be managed other operational Things like complaints, so we tracked uh, complaints and how they were trying to inverse the prior years. Um, and investment performance, it, it, again, there was an initial dip in March, um, but that quickly recovered. As, as you know, the market was kind of recovered shortly after. And then that was one of the things that kind of just dropped off the report, was no longer uh, in focus. And the health and wellbeing business, there was significant impact. So, so I think um, the Swift Care changed from being a walk in service to an appointment led. So before you could just walk up to Swift Care, now you had to remake an appointment and, 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 and come in. And, um, and we saw the actual footfall there dropping below a half. Um, and we asked it up a call center, a clinical call center, so you could get tryouts on the phone before you actually attended. So, so all of this, all of this change, all of this very significant impact on the business was tracked in the report each week. And it gave it gave the management to the, 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 the really kind of up to up to date, very rich kind of view of how, how the business was performing. Um, and it was a very successful use case. It, it, it led to real key decision making. We got very positive feedback and it really brought a lot of value to the business in, in, in what was a very difficult period. Um, yeah, if I could just uh, st step in there for a second as well, just to step back to the technical part of it again, I suppose, that, you know, as I was saying, at the very start, we really, I think our, our only data source that we had plugged straight in was the membership information. The rest of it was through the loader um, uh, and that loader was working for us every week, but it gave us that bit of breathing space, that time to, um, to start uh, delivering each of the individual sort of data sources that would might have been available to us so to the point today where we have not just membership but that claims data is plugged straight into reporting databases um there's also some of our, our 
uh, colleagues in the health and wellness uh, area have prepared data sources that we were, be, we were able to uh, hook in as well. And so we, we've been able to work with our stakeholders. Then, you know, the, 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 the loader sort of gave us, as I said, that breeding space. And now we've been able to sort of backfill uh, and replumb uh, in, into the actual uh, proper reporting data sources. Uh, now, there's still significant elements that come from the loader, uh, and that, that has been a, a, a good win for us in general. So I'll let Tara take it on to the next slides. Thanks, Owen. So just this is just our final slide, then just to kind of summary. So, so what, what's happened since and what's next? Um, there has been a huge surge in interest across the business and Tableau and, and the really valuable solutions that, that we've recruited it can bring in. And what's next? We're working with we're, we're working on driving a data culture in, in VHI. We set up the Tableau Champions and we have some very good creators in the company. And we're getting a lot of value collaborating as a cross-functional group. And we're trying to drive the best practice in terms of quality, technical uh, aspects, reporting, and, and, and governance aspects. Um, and there's now also a considerable drive from senior management um, to use Tableau. So, so the champions are working with, with the various teams across the business um, to help them get set up. And, and we're setting up the data sources they need. And then we're helping to build, say, building out the first couple of dashboards and then, and then support them through um, enhancing the data sources so that they can create their own reports and, and they can become self-sufficient and autonomous and, and get even more value out of the data. So just to just to finish off the last couple of lines, um, uh, so, so COVID, while it was a very challenging time for the company, it really has been the catalyst for change um, in many aspects and especially for Tableau uh, and, and, and that has really helped Tableau become the go-to report solution for VHI. So thanks very much for having us. Um, Absolutely brilliant guys, uh, really appreciate it, uh, very well done. Uh, it looks like um, Tableau's working for you uh, very nicely and, and was uh, very uh, timely in, in, in terms of, of, of how it helped um, the business uh, to, to, to make decisions um, in what was a, 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 apparently a very difficult time for you um, uh, without, without a shadow of a doubt. So a uh, great presentation there. We got a question from Siobhan Dunn, which, which you might have covered, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the question uh, anyway. Um, are you producing... So this is from Siobhan Dunn. Are you producing real-time reporting from your systems via Tableau or mostly extracts? No, it's 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 all ex extracts. Um, all our reporting is is um, day day after. So so we yeah. we'd be, we'd be working off, off extracts. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. And uh, she followed that up by saying that it sounds very streamlined. And she's saying, I'm assuming this is not really used for operational area, mostly management reporting. Um, is that correct? Yeah, I would, I would say so more so than that, there. Yeah, I think so. Well, 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 currently we're the only ones who are using it, and, and all of our data is for management information. And um, um, now we do have, we, like, we have we have our kind of set of reporting packs. We also have our dashboards that people can access, and, and we use for that as well. But um, but currently, yeah, like we're, we are well related to so our teams interested in the, in, in the approach. So, so yeah, um, there's but, there's a couple of operational teams that we're working with that. Uh, I, th I think they're going to start doing some nice reporting. Up, uh, well, but that that's just out of the the standard um, production da databases, and we're plugging into them with the with the Tableau. Okay, so you will be, you know, going forward, you'll be developing your use of it uh, most certainly, and um, by by the sounds of it, and. Uh... Absolutely, yeah. Like and that's that's what I was saying with the the, the process of of um, replumbing uh, into in, into the actual data sources. That's been a a, a key, uh, I suppose, enabler within the business because you're engaging with those stakeholders, um, those business, those, those people who understand that the, their their business needs, yeah. uh, and developing out those data sources with them. So then you know we're doing it for our purpose within yeah. our weekly reporting. But they're like, well, actually, yeah. this will work really well for our yeah, operational yeah. reporting. You know, so it's absolutely it's a win-win. Yeah, it's it, it's actually and that, there's a question from Rob Carroll uh, here, which probably feeds into that. And, and that is um, uh, for organizations starting to create a data culture, what uh, or what recommendations would you make? Um, it's a good question. Yeah, I, I got, from, from our experience, it seems, uh, and just from this experience that, that was sort of fo foisted on us in some ways, it, it's create that big shop window that, that everybody wants to be in. Um, uh, if you can, uh, you need a lot of, uh, I suppose, stakeholder uh, support for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, but but like you know, that's been key for us having that shop window, and um, you know, as, as Terence was saying, it's been driving the sort of senior management uh, interest in it as well, which then has trickled down because they've been like, well, give me give me the tableau, and um, 
Do you know, yeah. that they, they may not necessarily know what that means precisely, yeah. but, but you know, know they the, like it. Yeah, exactly. Like, I think having that one that one big report that's kind of really kind of made a change that yeah. certainly helps, and people see the value they can get, and then they come to us. Yeah. Hey, how you can help with this? How can we get more out of our data? And so, you, did so say, say you did say I don't want to go on too long, but this is my yeah. own. You did say at the beginning that you you had your own internal user groups. Am I right? Yeah, we kicked off at the start, but I think, and it was those good sessions, um, and yeah, and and, and and but I th I think there was a kind of lack of, and I think going out to good quality data sources, so so people were kind of competent and pulling their force together, but there was no data sources there. So now after a couple of years, kind of developing all that through. We can go back now, and here's the data source, very yeah. totally created, and then they can just get access straight away and understand what to do, and, and, and start pulling stuff together. Yeah, there was a maturity we needed to gain around how to how to manage ourselves uh, uh, with Tableau and that. Uh, so, so we 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 had to do the learning, um, uh, as did our colleagues across the company. So, uh, uh, it's just fortuitous that you know we we had done those two years of learning um, before the the ask came across our desk. Um, we probably wouldn't have been able to do that straight off the bat or even yeah. you know six months in we, we'd be struggling to, to do something like that but but yeah so it was, it was good timing yeah worth it all as well in the end uh, by the sounds of it uh Keir brennan uh who's a good friend of ours obviously has just posted there in the chat to say for data culture the tableau data culture playbook which is part of blueprint has a lot of good information and she's yeah. posted a link up there as well and and you're nodding in agreement with that there terence so yeah absolutely have a look at that i uh, just want to draw your attention as well to something that i posted in the chat there um uh, which was around yeah pictures if you have any pictures of yourself attending the uh, the event today please um take a picture and send it to me uh, at johnny.butler at the information lab.ie and we're always on the lookout for speakers as well and ideas um it's not a closed shop so if if you or your organization uses tableau uh and you know uh, you you think you're doing it differently or, and you have something to add or something that you want to tell uh, users in ireland and let's face it abroad i mean there's people dialing in from all over the world for this uh which is great uh we'd love to hear from you okay it's the same email address johnny.butler at the information lab.ie um terence and Owen, listen, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go over the pond now, across the Irish Sea we go. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Ella Warsdale, who's in the, the Peak District. And uh, Ella is from the NHS, and she is going to give us her presentation. And I'll let her introduce herself a little bit more and, and tell you uh, all about herself. So uh, Owen and myself will go on mute and we'll stop our cameras and we'll hand it over to Ella. Thank you very much, Ella. Hope you're well. Thank you, Johnny. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really chuffed to be at the Irish uh, talk. This is the first for me. Um, so I've got a 25 minute presentation about using Tableau in the NHS and in my organization. This is a five year story. So it's very, um, I've kind of just done the headlines of what's happened over the last five or six years and um, kind of a lot of stuff that's happened obviously in that period. So a whistle stop tour, hopefully. So let me just um, try and move this slide along. Um, what should I just tell you about myself briefly? So Johnny gave me a great introduction earlier, but just um, this is my introduction. So I'm a head of information for the NHS um, and I'll talk a bit more about my organisation in a minute. Um, I recently renewed my desktop qualified associates um, certification um, after it runs out after a couple of years. So just kind of for me, really to make sure that my tablet skills are up to date. Whilst I am a leader and a head of a department, I don't do dashboarding every day, but I just feel like understanding the technology is really important. So doing that qualification um, just kind of helps me make sure that I'm, my skills are up to date. Um, as Johnny mentioned, I'm a Tableau user group ambassador, which I'm really proud of, um, nearly two years now, and that's in light of um, lots of things, but generally to do with um, being a tug leader. I run two user groups, very greedy. Um, so Northwest Tableau user group in, in the UK and UK health tug, so health focus as well for kind of bringing every kind of NHS trust together and other private sector health in, in the UK. Everyone's welcome though, so it's a really good place for sharing ideas across healthcare. Um, and I am pretty obsessed with Tableau since I first discovered it back in 2014. It has been, and probably really this is sad, but a bit of a life changer. Discovering Tableau has massively changed my career and my outlook around data and everything. 
Um, and I am one of them people that likes to take pictures with signs that say things like day delicious. Um, so a bit about Pennine Care. So I've actually been in Pennine Care for 16 and a half years. So I'm well and truly embedded in the NHS. I'm really passionate about working in it. Um, I work in a Specialist Mental Health and Learned Disabilities Trust, um, which is across five areas of Greater Manchester so on the east side. Um, this is a big kind of population, 1.3 million. We've got 200 sites and nearly 4,000 employees. This is actually um, when we initially rolled out Tableau, the Pennant Care was quite a bit bigger and we included community services. So services like physiotherapy, um, out in the community district nursing and all that kind of, kind of double the size. We actually rolled out Tableau at the point when the organisation had a lot more different types of services, um, but we've had to go through a series of changes over the last few years. So that's Pennine Care. Um, so a bit of a brief history of my Tableau journey and Pennine Care's Tableau journey. So as I mentioned, I spotted Tableau in 2014. At that point, the organisation didn't really understand the benefits of data or business intelligence, and neither does most parts of the NHS generally. People know that we have to do reporting, there's lots of KPIs, and we're flooded with huge numbers of KPIs in the NHS that we've got to report against our commissioners and statutory reporting. Um, but we found a real struggle to kind of get people to engage with data at that point. Um, the organisation didn't have a pot of money to invest in a business intelligence solution, and this had been a battle for a long time. But I spotted a Tableau at a conference and a 10 minute presentation, I was just blown away. Um, mainly not just the kind of the way that it did dashboarding, but how easily it could connect to data. And that was kind of one of the areas that had been really struggled trying to find that kind of technology. So um, ahead of kind of early 2015, bought a couple of Tableau desktop licenses just to try it out and see what the fuss was about and maybe work out whether it would sue Pen and Care. Um, immediately kind of put down my Excel obsessions and realized the benefits of having that kind of technology. And, and luckily managed to get funding to support a small pilot in one of our areas, Oldham Community Services. So that was when things really changed. So we rolled out um, what basically replaced all routine reporting that was done through SQL reporting services and then dished out kind of once a month in Excel and then other kind of reporting that was more frequent. But we replaced all that in one area with Tableau. So we gave Tableau Server out to, um, well, it started off at 20 operational managers and then soon realised that they needed everybody engaged. So we by the end of the pilot, after three months, we have 50 operational managers accessing Tableau and about five or six different dashboards that replaced all their kind of routine. During that time, as people got used to the reports, we kind of grew them. Um, it, was a, it, was, it was a bit of an overnight success, which I'm really proud to say. I thought it was going to be really hard work. People were really kind of um, anxious about having another kind of NHS system forced on them, especially from some of our managers, and they really couldn't work out why they would want that kind of level of access to data. So there's lots of people that are quite cynical about it, but straight away they recognised the benefits of having an interactive tool that wasn't just about reporting, but they could get underneath the data. So whenever they didn't have confidence in the data that they were presented, that we presented back to them each month that they couldn't relate to, they could now kind of drill into it and find out list of patients behind the, the waiting list or different things like that. so they're drilling in and getting the patient level details and the staff level detail was absolutely the bit that really got people involved and also they could recognize their data so whilst we were doing routine reporting for a long time up to that point the numbers just didn't relate to how they thought services were being run but we could give them a lot more kind of embedded reporting through tableau and allow them to kind of drill down so straight away there was a shift in ownership of reporting and data quality and performance up till that had been seen as kind of a support service so if the data quality was wrong it's kind of like my fault or the performance team's fault that the data didn't really match and they couldn't take handle on it but straight away once they'd got tableau suddenly the managers started to engage the data quality improved the ownership performance really improved and they could really get behind the kpis and really understand what it was telling them so the pilot was such a success um, that we went on to write a business case and got secured funding. It took a bit of effort still just to kind of, I guess, um, persuade our senior management that this was the best thing to do. Um, but within the matter of um, a few weeks of getting the investment, I kind of made sure everything was set up and to allow us to roll out Tableau across the wider organisation into our other community services across all the boroughs and across mental health services. So again, we replaced every single kind of routine reporting using our warehouse and our kind of infrastructure set up 
to deliver all that routing reporting to uh, roughly seven under operational managers. So that implementation took two to three months to kind of get the basic report in replace and in Tableau at that point. During that time, we did lots of engagement, lots of promotion, really trying to encourage people to understand the benefits of Tableau. Um, we did drop-in sessions for all our users, basic training, and kind of just really promoted. So I spent a lot of time promoting, gave away kind of um, Tableau goodies. We got some post-it notes printed and things like that. And people <laughs> love that kind of stuff. But people really engaged and straight away it shifted the way that we did reporting, the way that people talked about data. And that was probably the most, um, the start of a huge kind of Tableau journey and a growing appetite for the benefits of data. As you can see, this was back in 2016. So um, during that course of time, the number of dashboards and the number of data that we'd got in Tableau just grew and grew and grew. Our team skills had to grow because they'd gone from using Excel and SQL reporting services and SQL to having to learn Tableau and also really learning how to use to present data. So data visualization and the skills within the team was a real challenge because we'd gone from kind of, I suppose, churning out basic reports because of the amount of time that we had to do reporting to really thinking about the way we present data and how we engage with our end users to really make sure that decision makers in our organization got value from the data they saw. So I suppose from 2017 to 2018, our numbers of dashboards and the amount of data that we kind of brought into Tableau grew and we just spent a lot of time embedding Tableau as the main source of reporting for the organization. Um, and then I suppose over the last 18 months to two years, um, We've been learning about how to also think about a data-driven culture and make sure that people are getting the most out of Tableau, but also about how it really changes the way that our organisation works, how we make sure we're getting the outcomes we deserve, how we make sure we're getting the right funding, and also thinking about the data culture, data literacy, and how we really turn ourselves into a data-driven organisation, which is something that's not easy overnight. Um, so there's been a lot of learning to work out where we got to Four years down the line with Tableau, we recognise the need to improve, improve. So I managed to secure funding about two years ago from our Greater Manchester Health and Social Care um, as part of a digital fund that we looked at improving the technology and making sure that we were upgraded and we could relaunch and kind of revitalise and make sure we still got the energy in Pennine for data and Tableau. So we took the opportunity to kind of relaunch. So why did we do this? So now we're at a point five years down the line. This is the main reporting and business intelligence tool for the organization. Most of our routine reporting and insight and intelligence come from Tableau. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about the types of reports. We've got, um, as I said, the, the organization slightly shrunk over the last few years, but we're still providing some of Tableau to external colleagues as part of an SLA. But we have 400 active users, probably from, there's about 700, 800 actual users of Tableau. But over the last three months, we've seen 400. So we're not hitting everybody, but we do have people engaged. We've got hundreds of dashboards now. So it's just grown and grown and grown far bigger than I could have ever imagined it would grow um, with lots of different slices. And yes, there's duplication. Yes, there's something around making sure that we've got the right dashboards at the right levels. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about why we're looking at improving. We've got multiple systems um, pulling in from our data warehouse and into Tableau both clinically and corporate. So we've got integrated views of performance. So we're not just seeing clinical data, we're also presenting data back to our managers and decision makers that have got um, workforce data in there, we've got finance data in there, we've got quality information around incidents, so anything to do with patient safety is in there, and other kind of smaller systems. So we've got an integrated view to provide the most intelligence that we can do. So we're not looking at things in isolation and not kind of looking at whether there's implications around the budget or sickness and patient capacity, making sure we've got everything that we can bring together. So we've got a really well-established integrated system that makes sure we've got the best intelligence we can um, if we need to. Um, five years down the line, um, we have had a shift in resource and stuff, but we're still growing our Tableau skills and growing our data visualization skills. It's not something that could be done overnight. We've invested heavily in making sure the team and people outside using Tableau have the right skills to both present the data and read the data, but our skills are growing and um, get involved in a lot in the Tableau community to make sure we are, we are developing our staff in the right way to make sure we're giving people the right information in the right way so they can digest it. Um, also managed to influence other areas of the NHS and social care to use Tableau, um, so, which is brilliant um, when we 
implemented Tableau in 2015, there was a handful of NHS trusts in England using Tableau. So the network of kind of learning was limited, but um, there's now quite a lot more using an, um, Tableau in both the NHS and our social care partners, which um, is really helpful in terms of that kind of shared learning and make sure we're kind of supporting each other and we're not kind of all doing it in isolation. So not every NHS trust uses Tableau as a mixture of other um, software. Some don't have anything close to a BI solution. So we're ahead of the game but this for me is really important in terms of learning that kind of networking as well as the wider tablet community having a healthcare uh, network is really important for our kind of growth and make sure we're doing the right things so that's where we're at now um in terms of the types of report that we do there's so many different angles that um again five years down the line we're doing basically everything we can do to get the most out of tableau so we've got our assurance report in there over the last few years we've really looked at the way that our board reports work and the way that our committee reports all the kind of governance levels to streamline it as much as possible and try to use Tableau where possible. There is still some manual kind of collation of that. There is still the expectation that they get a PDF report in our committees and our board, which is something I'm trying to work on, but it has using Tableau to bring the different KPIs to give them the different metrics has definitely streamlined it. And we looked at the way it's presented as well to make sure we present it in a way that really helps our board and committees and our governance structure understand what's going on. So we've streamlined it. So it's used for assurance reporting, um, which they can interact with. It doesn't have to export all the time, but they can do both. Um, situation reporting. So COVID, um, a bit like the guys were talking about at BHI earlier, um, we've needed to do a lot of reporting for COVID and we needed to understand the situation. So within a matter of days as the pandemic kind of kicked off, and the amount of data that we needed to support it. We implemented a new um, system to collect information about the COVID situation in terms of staffing and patients. And we've created um, a dashboard or a series of dashboards to support COVID situation um, through Tableau that are operational and senior managers can look at and it's live. So it's getting a live feed from our COVID collection system. So we can understand straight away what's going on, the impact on both our staffing levels and our patients and everything else kind of connected. So it's been pretty critical um, when pandemic started and people started to work out what we needed to collect we were on collecting some information from all our 280 teams manually on whiteboards so obviously needing tableau in there has been absolutely vital in the covid situation and we've used a lot of analysis over this period to understand what's going on from covid and then the impacts having on the organization and on our patients so we've got situation reporting that's just an example from a covid point of view but we do use it for other operational um, areas although live reporting is limited um, so management tools as I said we've got data pulling from different systems but we've got data pulling from finance and from um, our workforce system so we've got managers view so they can see what's going on with their staff so they can work out whether they've got sickness levels or where their budget's up to whether they manage training so it's used as a management tool as well as a reporting tool as well as assurance as well as kind of analysis it's there kind of an all-rounded and we're just making the best use of what Tableau can do for us and then obviously, for like everyone, it's about insight and intelligence. So we use it for analysis. We use it to kind of work out what's going on. And we have a lot of dashboards, but we do also use it for analysis as well and trying to present data back and understand what's happening. So it's used for a wide range of purposes. Some examples. So what's the outcome been to date? So ownership, I mentioned on the pilot, and that's been seen throughout the organisation. Yes, it's not perfect, and there's still stuff that we need to do. Um, but people have started to own the data. It's not kind of sitting corporately as something that we own and we have to report on it and we make up these KPIs. Our operational managers and leaders take ownership of the data to a degree and want to make sure that they're responsible for performance and the data quality. Data quality has improved. Um, there's still gaps and there's still issues, but it has improved compared to what it used to be because people can get underneath, the, people can see what the problem is and can go back into the source system and fix it um, without kind of a delay. The confidence in the data has grown. So we had issues around the uh, reliability of the data in all our reports, whether it was internal or going to our commissioners. People weren't, didn't always trust the data. and There's always kind of challenges over it. That confidence has grown. Again, there's still work to do, but it's definitely grown considerably come pre-Tableau days. Our data-driven learning has grown as well. So as I've said, we've used it for a load of different kind of data sets. Um, one of the areas we can talk about is kind of patient safety and instance we've got a suite of reports that now help us to understand why our instance happening and what patients are involved in in certain areas so we can really learn from it and use data to kind of inform that learning data driven decisions so that we've 
um, there's been increased funding, we've got identified areas that needed support or needed changing through using Tableau analysis to understand what's going on. So decisions have been driven by the data that's been provided in the evidence base. Um, there has been improvements in data literacy because people have access to something like Tableau now, um, the engagement's gone up and people's skills have had to grow. So there is expectation that um, people can read and understand data. Again, still more work to do, but it's definitely changed and improved. There is a huge appetite for data analysis in Pennine Care and our wider colleagues, um, and massively even more so in the last 18 months, as it's been pretty obvious that data has been pretty vital in the COVID pandemic, um, but internally understanding how the impacts on our staff and on our services has been absolutely critical. So the appetite for more data and more data analysis has become just growing and growing. Um, and we've now really got a great solid foundation for a data-driven environment. There's loads more we can do. And we're at the start, of, not the start, but kind of well into this journey, but getting everyone, every decision based on data is still somewhere we need to go, but we've got a great foundation, Tableau and the things we've done over the last few years has really helped us to move that on. So recently we've engaged in the last year in an improvement project. We've had user feedback around Tableau um, and usability because it's grown so much. And as I mentioned, 400 dashboards, not that they're all open to everybody, but people, when they first went on, there was like five dashboards they used to have to look at. Now there's loads of different things and they were getting a bit lost with it. So user feedback is it's not as accessible as they would like. So we're, 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 we're working on that and trying to work out exactly what to do. Engagement in certain areas and at a certain level of the organisation. So our operational managers and some senior managers have engaged, but there's still it's not necessarily used at every level of the organisation from board to ward or team. So there's some engagement from a self-service point of view anyway, in terms of people not engaging directly with Tableau or still waiting for reports or someone to suck and copy and paste things out of Tableau into another report, whereas we're kind of hoping for self-service. So there's some limited challenges in engagement. User experience, as I mentioned, sometimes challenges people not being able to use the dashboards or find what they needed. We've got some content gap in terms of that kind of board to ward view. There is some gaps in terms of making sure there's reports and structure at every level to understand how the kind of metrics throughout the, um, throughout the organization are working. So we've got some content gaps. The demand has massively grown over the last five years. Obviously, you can see how much data is in there, but it's just getting more and more complex. And the, and the more the data is out there, there's more questions. So the demand just grows and grows and grows, and we need to try and keep up with that. And we've had some technology infrastructure. So we've, um, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're in an improvement project. And one of the challenges was we hadn't upgraded in the last few years of Tableau because we kind of got stuck on 10.4. So that has limited some of our ability to build dashboards in a really slick way. So we've had some challenges around our infrastructure. So what we've looked at is um, I've implemented a four pillars of improvement. Um, methodology. This is loosely based on the Tableau blueprint, but putting it into kind of language that our organisation really understands and they can get on board with, because um, engagement's really key in terms of having a support from our senior leaders to make sure they support improvement and make sure we move towards data driven and make the most of Tableau. They need to understand it, they need to get it. So we have to kind of change the language and make sure it's really understood for them. So looking at four areas of improvement and we've, and we've started on this journey now. So making sure the technology is robust, making sure the infrastructure that don't follow, we've got live reporting or any reliance on Tableau, we have to make sure it's fit for purpose and there's nothing going to go wrong. Making sure it's accessible, make sure we're keeping an eye on it and keeping an eye on the stats and make sure people are engaging. And obviously we need to make sure that the data is secure and people are accessing what they should be accessing. Um, in terms of dashboards, we need to make sure they're as efficient as possible so people can get to the insight really quickly. Our clinicians, our managers don't have time to kind of sit there and explore lots of data. They kind of need it really easy and really understand. So the dashboards analysis has to be efficient. It's got to be accessible. So we've got to make sure our dashboards are user friendly and really intuitive. Got to be relevant. So we've got loads of dashboards, as I said, but trying to find what's relevant for people in different roles sometimes has been a challenge. So making sure what we dish out to people is really relevant for them in their roles. And working on, we've always kind of worked in um, collaboration and co-design with our clinicians and managers, but we're making that more formal and kind of more of an agile way and giving people um, product owners of different dashboards. Um, working on skills, making sure we've got a professional framework for our analysts to develop into and our Tableau developers, making sure their skills are progressing to support this organization. 
and also thinking about data literacy for our consumers, assuming that we're going to have a data-driven organisation relies on their data literacy skills and us supporting them to have that. And also having a role-based framework that is really explicit about people, skills and what the responsibilities at each level. So what should they be looking at, how often and what is the expectation for them? So being really specific about that. And engagement is really key. So creating a community, making sure we're communicating regularly about what's in there and providing a really solid support. Um, conscious of time, but hopefully I'm nearly there. So our revitalization and our improvement, this is what we love. This is what we just relaunched about six weeks ago with a new user-friendly portal. So we've got a portal uh, built by, through the Interworks Curator that sits on top of our Tableau server to make it really accessible and have lots more content to help our users because one thing that he's struggled with is trying to navigate themselves around um, the usual Tableau server. So we wanted to make it really easy for people. So having a web kind of website feel to it has been really important. So that's gone down really well. So that user from all collaborative development, making sure our dashboards are intuitive, creating a new core suite of dashboards that help the clinical structure of the organization to get to access to what they need. Uh, we've got dashboard recommendations built into the portal. We've got virtual, uh, user groups and training available on a regular basis, building in guidance and a data dictionary, making sure our KPIs and our descriptions and our definitions are really clear so people know exactly what they're looking at so they can't really go, well, why does that say that over there and that? So being a lot more transparent with our kind of underlying data and rolling out a kind of skills level, a proficiency level. So we've got a number of badges, Tableau Champion, Data Literacy, Product Owners, Super Users, so that people can um, go through a series of training, get some skills and get a badge and they can put it on the bottom of their emails and promote their skills. So we're not always relying on central services to support our Tableau users. And in doing that, creating a real Tableau community within Pennine to drive that data informed culture and get people and the buzz around Tableau and data really going. So I think I went a little bit over time. Um, so that's kind of a story, very whistle stop, as I said, five years in 25 minutes, um, um, probably not. We miss loads of bits but that's kind of our story thank you for your time um i'm on twitter i've got a blog and stuff so if you want to get in touch you can do Ella, get yourself a glass of water there uh that was an absolutely <laughs> amazing presentation and i have written down about 10 questions here but i'm not sure i'm going to have the time to ask all of them i love the revitalized part at the end uh, you have your own sort of in-house certification well not certification but badges and that kind of thing how many yeah. different levels of of that do you have and and does it work well so this is something new in the last five weeks so we relaunched with the portal five weeks ago and within the portal now they've, they've got badges so we've we've only launched one so far so we've got the tableau champion badge yeah. which is about and basically they do only like an hour's worth of they've got to watch a video where i'm chunt around for an hour um, but it's about data literacy and basic Tableau skills and okay. also the agreement that they will champion Tableau and support users. So that's kind of like a champion's badge. Um, so the levels are more around kind of a guest engagement. A product owner will be around um, that they, again, will support users, but will take ownership of a product within Tableau. Yeah. Then we've got super users. When we get to the point where we want to release a little bit more control over building things, then we're going to roll out super users. And then there's a basic kind of data literacy again, so people feel more confident. I think there's a confidence issue sometimes with using technology in the NHS or in businesses generally, um, and thinking people are, they think they're going to break it. Yeah. So you kind of want to encourage them that it's not as hard as they think it yeah, is. Yeah, I know what you giving mean. Giving them that kind of badge, and they love badge. Everybody, everybody loves a badge. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Look, from the land of blue Peter badges, uh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. So I, I, I have one other question, if I can. Um, you, you, you were going through your list there uh, and you had data driven decisions, right? Um, have you any examples of that in sort of on the ground of, of how what you've been able to deliver has led to somebody, you know, saying, OK, what we're going to do is this and, and the outcomes have been brilliant. Have you any examples? Yeah, so there was one and it is quite an old example, but it's always sticks in my mind is that I suppose before Tableau, it wasn't very easy to see whether it was children's services. You couldn't tell whether children were being seen by more than one clinician. So depending on how complex their needs are, they're being seen by, say, a physio and a dietitian and a okay. series of different practitioners. And it wasn't clear from our kind of, I suppose, electronic patient system that lots of our children were being seen by up to eight different clinicians 
probably sometimes twice in a day, sometimes a few times in a week. So we created a, a report that allowed, or a dashboard that allowed them to see how many uh, children were being seen by multiple professionals. And once they saw that data and saw the kind of quantities and how many patients were, they changed the service model completely to make sure that was far more transparent and that they had a kind of key care coordinator rather than just seeing eight separate people who didn't really know what was going on with each other, uh, bringing that together into a slightly different care model. So a massive kind of improvement for our children um, and only possible really, um, it would have been possible, I guess, within SQL and stuff, but it just was so much easier and also something that they could keep and keep an eye on um, long term. So a huge so, change. So it saved you time. In, in the NHS, and it was a better outcome for the kids. Exactly. Simple. Yeah. Which you can't. That's, that's, that's what it's all about, like, isn't it? Like, that's the end <laughs> yeah, game. Exactly. You know, it's 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 the change on the on the floor. Uh, you know that you want. That's brilliant. Okay. I, I have lo so many, but I, I'm going to have to do it another time in an email. Um, but I, I just I have loads. Um, I just want to see. Do I have anything? Uh, Deirdre Flaherty. I Matt asked the question. What platform form format did you use for Tableau user groups? I think you answered that fairly well. Um, at the end, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, so the users and so we have drop in well drop -in, bookable <coughs> drop in sessions. <laughs> Um, which is just through Microsoft Teams and they come along and we've got a bit of a script and then we've got kind of targeted sessions and then the user groups will basically, um, yeah. we will only be having user groups for our Tableau champions. We'll have got drop-in sessions and support virtual training sessions for our general Tableau users and then we're going to have a super kind of champion user group where they can give suggestions and a bit like this format really sharing yeah. the benefits of using Tableau to really kind of promote um, the benefits of using Tableau within the organisation. Brilliant. I think I think that the, the thing that stands out for me is the amount of buy-in that you've got from from people, um, and and how you did that was 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 really interesting. I, I think it's it's really really impressive. I have to say. There's one other question from Deirdre Flaherty for, uh, for the built-in guidance and data dictionary. I noted the data dictionary as well. Actually, something that uh, that that I thought was very interesting. How was this implemented? Is it built into the dashboards? So um, I wouldn't like to say we've finished or even we're literally just at the start of it because I think that's been one of the biggest challenges is that we haven't, for whatever reason, we haven't really built that into our four years of dashboards or 400. So we're starting to build that into the actual dashboard. So there's going to be an extra page on each dashboard where they can click in and make sure they're checking the definitions. We're also alongside, so that's kind of a bit of manual at the moment. We're building a API metric repository so that every single KPI and metric we've got in the organization has kind of got a standard definition and we're going to make that exposed to the organization as well. So there'll be kind of two places to look at definitions and guidance. Okay, I have one other question. It's really, I and mean, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, where, where do, and then that's it, and we'll move on to the next, sorry guys. Where do you see it in five years time? Ooh, um, I would, or where uh, would you like to see it? Users, more champions and active use at a senior level so that it's just part of the organization and the way they make decisions at the moment it's still um kpis Which, and yeah. data quality and stuff was actually being part of planning and just yeah. being it just being the go-to rather yeah. than oh i need to do you know what i mean just being in, integrated i guess into day-to-day -day working whereas it's still something as an necessarily an afterthought but it's not necessarily the first thing they do in the morning but my vision is that they open up Tableau before they open up their emails? Well, I think I think what comes across really is the is the passion for it, and uh, <laughs> it's uh, remarkable, uh, really. And I really enjoyed that presentation. I have to say, and and I and I'm sure everybody else did as well. And thank you very uh, much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very it. much. Okay, um, from the Peak District, uh, it's over to Chicago. Uh, we're going to cross the Atlantic, and we are going to say a special thanks. Uh, to Mark Connolly and Louise Heelan, who got up at 5 a.m. Uh, to present and uh, have been waiting patiently to give us their presentation. So, guys, listen, in terms of the time, don't worry about it. Uh, you're, you're, you know, OK, we did say 12.45 to end, but if it ends at 5 to 1 or whatever, that, that, that's fine. OK, if you just leave a little bit of time for, for a Q&A or whatever at the end, because I'm sure there'll be plenty. I'm going to go on mute and uh, I will hand it over to Mark and Louise. And again, sincere thanks for this. I'm really looking forward to it.
Awesome. Um, so I will share my screen and get us going. Um, that should be very blank for everybody. Yeah, it looks perfect. And how about now? Great. Absolutely cool. fantastic. Awesome. So uh, we'll, we'll just kind of kick it off. Uh, what we're hoping to do today, uh, we'll give an intro uh, who we are. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our response to COVID-19 uh, and then wrap up with those dashboard starters uh, before we get to the Q&A at the end. So who are we? Uh, I'll go first. Uh, I'm Mark Conley. I'm a BI lead uh, with our data and analytics team at UChicago Medicine. Uh, I've been with our organization almost five years uh, this August, I believe. Um, and my role really is focused on how we're leveraging Tableau here. Uh, so that's advanced reporting needs like a response to COVID, uh, but it also uh, includes training from the report consumer to report developer and everything in between uh, for it. I will make a quick plug that I am a uh, co-lead for the healthcare, the virtual healthcare uh, user group, uh, Tableau user group. Uh, so if all of these topics interest you, uh, it, it's a great group if you want to come back for more, or if you happen to be a healthcare speaker uh, or work in a healthcare role and want to present to that group. Uh, primarily, it's US and UK uh, that are our largest audiences, but it is a virtual uh, group. And uh, I like to take the claim that we are one of the first virtual groups, even pre COVID, uh, with it. But with that, I'll hand it over to Louise to intro herself. Hi, good morning, everybody. So my name is Louise Hewlin. I am a data scientist at the University of Chicago Medical Center. So I've been in this role, it'll be three years in the summer. Um, but as Johnny alluded to at the beginning, I was born in Ireland, so that is my connection. Um, I moved to Canada when I was six, so the accent is gone. However, my parents still maintain their accent. So it's been really amazing hearing all the accents uh, in, this, in this meeting this morning. It sort of has a sense of home and familiarity to me, which is great. Um, I do visit Ireland quite often still, all my family is still there. Can't wait to get back so I can get my fill of Tito crisps and Club Orange, <laughs> which I always miss. Um, but so prior to this role um, as a data scientist here, <laughs> thumbs up Johnny, yeah, Tito. <laughs> um, I, uh, I got a PhD in particle physics and uh, spent 10 years in Switzerland, hence the background. Uh, so. Uh, you know, living in Europe has, has sort of uh, been, uh, you know, um, my history. And uh, yeah, so honored to be here today and speaking to you guys about some of the work that we've done around COVID um, at the hospital. I'll hand it back to Mark. Uh, so some background on UChicago Medicine, uh, who we are uh, in, in kind of a, a scope uh, set here. Uh, so we are an academic medical center uh, located on the south side of Chicago. Uh, we have four inpatient facilities, uh, and honestly, I think this ambulatory care facilities might be a low number now. Uh, we've continued to expand our ambulatory reach uh, in the area. Uh, we do have uh, just under 1,300 licensed beds, so for the inpatient and observation population, uh, and we're around 1,100 1, to 12,000 uh, staff uh, with our organization. Annually, uh, we're a touch under uh, a million uh, outpatient encounters. Uh, and around 45,000 to, I think now uh, even a little bit higher, closer to 50,000 hospital admissions a year uh, for us. And a few other metrics uh, are available for you if you wanted the reference. And there's a picture of our campus, which I, I don't know, I've actually been there uh, recently. We've been working remote, but uh, our campus on the south side. Um, and I think an important thing, and uh, credit to Louise for making sure that we call this out, uh, we know when we're presenting to folks in the Chicagoland area, when we say Southside, they know the types of patient population that we're working with in the community that we're in. Uh, when we go more uh, virtual or uh, across the oceans, uh, we do wanna call out that our community is a community that uh, has faced uh, disparities and not just in a COVID front, uh, but in healthcare in general, uh, a lot of uh, issues related to access to care uh, and, and things like that. So prepping for this, I did kind of do a quick search and, and just stole some headlines uh, from various articles to give you a sense of what this has looked like for COVID specifically. Uh, but I think uh, from my perspective and, and working with uh, folks within our organization, a lot of the disparities and outcomes that we were seeing uh, it related to COVID really just highlighted things that have always existed. Uh, and, and folks within uh, the healthcare space, specifically uh, in Chicago, 
have been aware of it and it's not that we haven't been working towards it it's just a pandemic came in and really uh put a lot of pressure on areas that uh struggled so do you want to kind of set that uh at, at um kind of level set uh our patient populations that uh, we're trying to uh, help uh, in, in order to do that, we do have to be data driven, whether it be COVID or any of the work that we're doing and really kind of have an equity lens uh, to a lot of our work here. A little context though about uh, us using Tableau. Uh, this is a Tableau user group. Uh, we did deploy a Tableau server around July, 2017. Uh, right now we're around 30,000 uh, views a quarter uh, and just under or just over uh, 1200 viewers quarterly. Um, we're presenting more from kind of a clinical quality perspective, but our server is used by all sorts of analytics groups across the organization, including our finance team, our supply chain, uh, HR, and, and others. Um, and do have uh, a quick little snapshot of a KPI report we had uh, or have uh, in uh, way back when uh, we did actually use a starter uh, that the information lab had uh, made available. Uh, we tweaked it. Uh, since then uh, to meet a few of the different needs and asks uh, of our group, but uh, we use this to kind of have a pulse check of what our engagement looks like, what reports are uh, being used, uh, as well as when and, and, and who uh, might be accessing our reporting. And then our team. Uh, so uh, Luis and I are on a, a team of many, uh, and we're going to be presenting work, uh, but by no means we're really the only people involved in that. Uh, and this is specifically the kind of smaller team that we work on, uh, and we'll uh, get to how we also connected with other uh, uh, key teams uh, within our organization. But do want to give that shout out uh, for those that might be sleeping and still um, uh, on our team, but uh, definitely a, a really uh, strong, great team that we have that uh, made a lot of this work possible. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Luis and I will be navigating slides. So just let me know when you're ready to go. Perfect. Thanks, Mark. So yeah, I will talk to you guys a little bit about how our hospital responded to COVID. Going to the next slide. So, you know, putting these slides together, I thought, you know what, let's take a step back. Although we all know COVID and we probably are sick of hearing about it. It's sometimes surprising to go back to those early days and think, you know, we didn't know what was coming and this was all so new and it escalated so quickly sort of across the globe. And, you know, from a hospital perspective, we didn't know what was coming our way. You know, it started off in China, but it spread real quickly. And I think, you know, probably for all of us here, when it hit Italy, that outbreak there, that really was when it started to creep really close to home. And we really weren't sure what to expect. You know, so looking back at the timeline, COVID-19 became a thing and the official name back on February 11th, 2020. So that was when the WHO decided to call it COVID-19. Um, and then, you know, shortly thereafter, a month later, March 11th is when the WHO declared this as a pandemic. Um, and so that was really, you know, an eye opener, I think, for all of us. Um, so Chicago is in the state of Illinois in the US. And on March 20th is when our state declared a stay at home order um, and things really shut down quite quickly in Illinois compared to many other states across the US. And I do have to give credit to to our state here. Um, Chicago is the third biggest city in the US and, you know, following New York City and also LA. And thankfully, we haven't had the same, you know, outbreak that some of these other larger cities have seen. And I, I do really credit that to, to the response of the of both uh, the state level and uh, the city level. But if we flip to the next slide, um, we can see from the University of Chicago perspective, um, on March 15, 2020 was the first time we tested a patient for COVID-19. Um, and you know, that's when things really got real and we started to have this data coming in and we didn't, you know, we didn't know what to expect. So from there, we had to start building out these reports because we do use Tableau quite, um, quite heavily as Mark was saying across the organization. And so within five days of that first test, we had our first Tableau dashboard um, out surrounding COVID-19. So you can see that it wasn't just, you know, how quickly it was spreading, but also within our organization, how quickly we needed to get data out to our stakeholders. Um, next slide. So we did, of course, need to have a data-driven response. Um, I have a small child beside me. It's 6.30 in the morning here. Uh, so my kids are just waking up and they have great Irish names, Sean and Kira. So they are just waking up. So sorry if you hear any noise in the background. But um, so yes, yeah, so we did need a data-driven response um, to be able to share with the organization at an aggregate level and also at a detailed level, what was happening across the system. 
And, you know, again, this came with a very urgent request. And I think this was also shared by the first speakers um, from, you know, uh, Owen and Terrence, that it was all sort of very urgent that these outputs needed to come. But along with that, there was many different new data sources that needed to feed these reports that we had never had to play with before. So we had to be able to plug in data that came from operational systems, also from our labs, because we were very fortunate at the University of Chicago to have on-site lab testing for COVID-19. And most places didn't have that. And we had that, you know, literally from uh, March 15th. So it was great that we could get access to that lab result data so quickly for our patients and, and even the community at large. Um, and so there was a lot of new data elements that were coming into the electronic health records that we had to be able to pull in you know, to our reporting and then be able to present within Tableau. Um, something that was very new for us, which we had never done before, was being able to plug a real-time data feed into our Tableau reports. And uh, we, we had to learn how to do that in a very short period of time. And we worked with IT to be able to do that. Um, and this is now a report that, you know, is probably one of the highest views reports that we have and continues to be used being fed by real-time data. So this was definitely something that we learned um, how to do technically through COVID-19. Uh, next slide, Mark. So of course we couldn't do this in a, in a silo, as I mentioned. So we did work with IT um, and, you know, as, as the COVID pandemic was developing very early in those days, we had probably daily meetings with clinicians. So people in the ICU, you know, what are they seeing just so it would help make sense to us of the data that we were seeing, but also what did they need to see to be able to make the decisions um, on, on the care for the patients. Um, we did work with other, other analytics teams. So we had to pull information across, you know, with respect to budget and supply chain, you know, how are we looking across the board? So, um, you know, we really came together as a system and uh, had to collaborate in that way. We also had um, project management teams that were supporting us. And so we met with them every day at 11 a.m. Uh, to really understand, you know, what was happening at, at the highest levels and how could we support those um, decisions that were being made. And even within our own team, you know, even it, it became a big change too because we all had to work remote suddenly and this was a new shift for us. So we had to figure out how to be able to do that effectively. Um, and, you know, with all these new constraints and this urgency and, uh, you know, we definitely learned a lot of lessons from that too. And I think we were quite successful in that. So the next slide. So technically then behind the scenes, under the hood of how we were feeding these uh, Tableau reports that were going out, we did develop many different data marts, so different tables. Um, and so mo in many cases, mo most of our data then is stored in a SQL server and um, we have scripts that run automatically every day and it updates the, these, uh, these tables. So when we were trying to figure out what are we gonna need for this COVID pandemic, we really had to sit down and think about the engineering of it all. How did we wanna construct this, these tables and these data marts such that they'd be you know, optimally flexible because we didn't know what the future use cases were going to be. And so on top of that, um, you know, anyone who's dealt with healthcare data knows it's extremely messy. Um, you have people that are entering fields in manually. So, you know, there's all data quality issues. But on top of that, you've got, especially when it came to this pandemic, there was changing policies, you know, changing workflows. So, you know, suddenly somebody was defined in a certain way and, and then it was all shifted. Um, so you had to be able to write the code um, flexibly enough to be able to manage that and thoughtfully enough, you know, to, to think about all these different cases, but also then design your Tableau reports, um, you know, with that balance and that with flexibility in mind. So we definitely developed many different data marts, you know, and just to, to highlight a few, I guess, um, one that um, I, I know and love very well is, is, the, is a COVID-19 lab registry that we put together. Um, so this really is all of the testing results um, you know, the COVID-19 testing results that we had for our patients. This, you know, had to be built very mindfully. There was a lot of changing criteria as we went along, um, you know, things like, was the patient symptomatic or not symptomatic at the time of the order? Why were they getting the order? Um, early on, and, you know, and, and actually for probably a year, anybody who was coming into the hospital for any sort of surgery got a, a pretest for COVID. So they weren't symptomatic necessarily of COVID, but we had to be able to track that sort of information. On top of that, we were also tracking the timing of when these lab tests were happening. So when were they ordered? When was the specimen taken from the patient? When did the lab receive it? When did they have a result back? Just so we were able to monitor all of these different timing stamps um, to, you know, to understand that workflow of just the labs themselves. 
Um, and you know, a few other a few other data marts on here um, that I will call out. So you can probably see near the end. There's quite a few vaccine related COVID COVID, um, COVID vaccine data marts that we've put together recently. There is different ways in which you can view vaccines. You know, of course, we administer vaccines at the hospital for our patients, but there are some patients that could get it, you know, at the local um, pharmacy as well. So being able to, you know, reach into some central repository and, and you know, let's say nationwide and pull out um, that information and pull that into our reports is also important. And finally, the last one on this page, um, HHS COVID, this is um, a data mart that we put together that really provides data on a daily basis, mandatory re required reporting to the federal government. And this contains information around, um, you know, how many COVID patients we have, you know, uh, overall, how many were admitted yesterday, how many people visited the emergency department that were suspected of COVID, how many people died. So this is something that gets updated daily. And in fact, we do have a Tableau report that, um, you know, displays this information for uh, the people who are entering it in uh, into the government. So um, this is just a, a small subset of some of these COVID related data marts that we had to put together mindfully um, in, in creating these reports. Uh, next slide then. So on top of that, on top of the data marts and the tables themselves that were that are sort of fixed in SQL, we also have different views that we put together. Views allowed us some flexibility in that they're not necessarily run you know, every day at 6 a.m. Uh, because we do have quite a few jobs that are scheduled. These are just things that populate once you call them. So it's not something you necessarily need every day, but um, you know, on the fly being able to pull that information. Some of, the complicate, some of the more complicated piece of logic that we had to put into place was evaluating who has COVID. You would think that would be a really easy you know, question to answer, who is a confirmed COVID patient? But especially early on, that was challenging. You know, there was limited number of supplies in terms of testing. So of course, if somebody tests positive for COVID, you say, oh, you have COVID. Um, you know, and you're being admitted, you're sick, great, you know, and, and here's your treatment journey. But what if a patient had a positive COVID test a week ago in some drive-through clinic, and then, you know, subsequently became really sick and had to be admitted, do you retest them? Are they sick because of COVID? You know, how do you define that COVID confirmed patient? We also had patients under investigation. So these were patients that maybe didn't have a, a confirmed test yet, but had a lot of the symptoms and were having a COVID test. And these two groups of people really defined you know, the protocols that the clinicians needed to have, you know, the full PPE and all of the equipment that would be required to treat those patients. So having a sense of what those numbers looked like, those, those, those numbers looked like in-house was really important in terms of planning, um, you know, and planning in terms of supplies that were needed and hospital staff and also resources in terms of beds. Um, so these were sort of some of the uh, views there. So I will stop on the view part and flip to the next slide. So these were all the underlying data that we had to build um, and allow some flexibility because we didn't, again, know what sort of information people were going, going to use. But in the end of the day, you know, our senior level leadership, what they were looking at was our Tableau dashboards. And they were using them to make clinical decisions, operational decisions on the ground. And so here's just a list of some of them. So we did have this real time report and this really was plugged into the lab side. Um, and that was that is, continues to be used quite frequently. We had in Tableau dashboards around the census. So looking at who is in our, who is in house, we say, who is in the hospital, who has COVID-19, who is under investigation, who is in the ICU um, and being able to track these trends over time. We looked at uh, timing of workflows to understand if there were bottlenecks in any of, of the workflows so we could really you know, address that, whether it be more manpower, uh, to make sure that things were done in a timely manner, because of course time was of the essence here really. And we had many patients coming in and we just didn't even know if they had COVID. So we had to make sure that we were you know, understanding our patients' needs and addressing them timely. Um, you know, as Mark said as well, you know, we do have a very interesting po patient population. Um, and so, you know, and that could have been very susceptible to COVID-19 given the community that we, we work in. And so being able to look at the outcomes of our patients, you know, was very important. And in terms of, you know, equity as well, and, you know, who was having adverse outcomes, what sort of treatment paths were they having? Um, and we definitely leveraged Tableau to be able to, to do that. Um, and, you know, as of recently, we, we have, you know, vaccine related dashboards as well um, to really track similar sort of things, you know, the communities and the groups and their vaccination rates but also some um, you know, you know, other flags that we can build into those Tableau dashboards. 
Um, one of the bigger reports that came out, um, we call it the Global Operations Dashboard, and this is really a one snapshot of how the hospital is doing. Um, it's a really impressive report. It, it goes through the, you know, there's a slice for the emergency department, a slice for, you know, in terms of inpatients, people are in-house, um, a slice surrounding outpatient appointments and a slice around procedural, um, you know, uh, you know, things like surgeries and any other procedures, you know, radiology, imaging sort of stuff. So we tie that together with budget to really see if we're on target, but we also tie it together with COVID data. And this is a report that goes out um, daily to people and they can get a quick snapshot of what is going on in the hospital. And, you know, this has been one of the most successful dashboards that I think has come out of the work that we've done. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that through these dashboards, you know, anybody who wasn't necessarily on the, on the Tableau train before certainly got on the Tableau train, I would say in the hospital, because this is where all of the reports came out. We weren't really doing, you know, separate Excel files for people to look at. This is where the data was landing. Um, and so uh, this was a, a real good push for us with respect to Tableau usage across the hospital. So next slide then, so impacts. Um, so of course, you know, I think I definitely touched upon a few of them as I spoke, but you know, the hospital leadership really was monitoring these dashboards to be able to make clinical and operational decisions across the hospital. Um, I definitely touched upon the equity lens, um, you know, and as of recently, th these vaccine dashboards that we have, um, some of the things that they're used for is we look at flagging, I, I wanna say, vaccination mismatches. So we, we administer Pfizer at our hospital and we, you know, we schedule appoint, uh, appointments for patients to come in to, to get that. But again, because we are pulling from sort of a, a federal database, we can see if any patient has potentially had, you know, a different vaccine somewhere else, or maybe it was too soon to get a second follow-up shot. So we are able to track this and flag any of these potential mismatches, um, you know, again, to be able to, uh, you know, whether that's to save uh, vaccines, but also, you know, clinically to make sure that we don't have any uh, mistakes happen there. And the other thing that we're tracking now with respect to COVID and the vaccine is looking at, um, you know, positive COVID cases in patients who have been fully vaccinated or, you know, on their vaccination journey, whether that's after a first dose or a second dose and the timing windows of that. So this really gives our infection control leadership um, information, you know, and this is updated every single day that they can look at and make decisions um, with. And so, you know, as, as I said, these these dashboards that spawn from COVID-19, um, they, they have been very successful. We have 200 subscriptions that are sent to our leaders every single day that track census, um, our COVID volumes, volumes overall, um, and the surgery and procedures that are ongoing. Next slide. I will hand it over here. to Mike then. Cool. So uh, we'll jump into the last section that we have uh, for all of you today, our dashboard starters. Uh, I know Luis alluded to a little bit of uh, the, the various reports that we had created, yeah, but something that uh, uh, we started to see and, and recognize is that we weren't the only people uh, dealing with COVID, obviously, um, and uh, other organizations uh, were going through the exact same thing, uh, maybe, maybe with a different uh, electronic health record uh, and maybe their own circumstances. But uh, through a few of the folks that I know through the Tableau user group uh, kind of community, uh, I, I was hearing of uh, healthcare organizations that were having to furlough or even lay off their own analytic staff. Uh, so you're kind of piling on to a very difficult situation for uh, for organizations to make data-driven decisions in a pandemic. Um, so when we started to see that, we kind of had a discussion because we haven't truly shared a lot of our work publicly outside of maybe a formal presentation uh, in that sense, but uh, did get the uh, kind of green light uh, from our leadership team to make some of our dashboards available with dummy data. Uh, so not our a true patient performance, really kind of the shells of the reports uh, and, and put them on Tableau Public. Uh, with the hope that other folks uh, and other organizations might be able to use it, whether it be to totally take over and, and just like feed in with their own data or uh, to even uh, just use it as a starting point and have a pulse of what are other organizations looking at. Um, and while we were working on this, uh, Tableau, the company, was also working on their COVID-19 data hub, uh, which this became a part of uh, and, and, and connected in through there. So I know, Johnny, you had mentioned uh, that we showed up on that 
kind of happened all in parallel and they obviously were pulling in other reports that other organizations and groups were uh, creating, not just in the healthcare uh, space, but in other spaces as well, uh, because the pandemic definitely uh, impacted all industries and in all kind of areas of the world. So what I'm going to do uh, is just go quickly through these. Uh, Luis actually did a pretty good job of highlighting uh, some of them. Uh, in the last couple of minutes, I'll flip to one of our uh, reports on Tableau Public just to show how to kind of navigate it in Tableau Public. Uh, and then we'll leave it up to anyone who is interested to kind of explore the rest. So the real-time uh, status dashboard uh, was one of the first ones that we got created. And uh, like Luis mentioned, uh, was the first time that we had to work with real-time data. And this was really leveraging a lot of the testing data specifically uh, for us and, and getting that feed in. But it allowed us to get a number. And I still remember uh, very vividly uh, the first time that we were pulling this data in. Uh, to see the number of patients that were confirmed in our hospital, I thought there was a data quality issue. Uh, to be totally frank, uh, there wasn't. We truly just had that many patients uh, uh, by the time that we were already pulling data up. Um, so this really gave us a pulse of how things were going. And, and to this day, it's still uh, one of those reports that you kind of go to for that pulse check of what's going on here. Um, and the report itself is really looking at volume where they're at, and then what our testing volume and positivity rate has looked like over time. Another dashboard that we created uh, to give a little bit more of the trend, uh, the real time uh, for the most part was what's going on today. This is what's been going on. Uh, so uh, a census allowed us to look at uh, what our volumes look like over time, but also did bring in a little bit around uh, how we were utilizing our ventilators uh, to give it a, a sense of uh, kind of that utilization, which uh, was a big, um, I think a constant concern for many organizations was, do we have enough ventilators? Do we have enough equipment uh, to meet the growing demand there? And uh, this really kind of helped our ICU and operational side kind of monitor and plan for what, what's been happening. And uh, I, I don't know if we touched on it, but COVID was such a shift to what healthcare was experiencing. The ability to leverage historical data uh, for modeling and predictive analytics kind of went out the window. It was a totally different environment and it took a little bit of time uh, for us to get a, a, a true sense of the, the, what was going to happen. So what has happened uh, in the last couple of days or weeks uh, really became uh, important for our leadership team until we were able to uh, really get into more of the predictive or modeling side of things. Workflow timing. Uh, this became an important thing uh, with all of the uh, kind of restrictions and uh, um, precautions that uh, any healthcare organization had to take with COVID, uh, this adds time. Uh, so it's testing, it's uh, making sure that uh, patients are being cleared after they have a test. So you uh, know whether or not you need to have the full, like the, uh, I'm blanking down the right word, but full PPE, uh, protective uh, personal equipment. Um, or if you could uh, just go in more with a mask and, and standard gloves and things like that. So this really looked at what that time looked like and uh, how we were uh, working through our workflow of reviewing each potential uh, COVID patient to confirm or clear them. Moving on. Uh, patient outcomes. Uh, this one, uh, it, I think uh, we touched on a little bit as well. Um, and it's not a nice like uh, nice to have, uh, I think this was critical uh, for us to really have a pulse of uh, how are our different patient populations performing. Uh, at the top, there are quick KPIs around uh, our length of stay, our uh, kind of discharge and admission volumes, uh, the percentage of patients that were requiring an ICU stay and uh, the number of deaths that we were having uh, for us. And we had the ability in the report, it is interactive more than kind of like a quick spit out of, of outcomes uh, towards the bottom, but within the report, you can kind of toggle and break your data out by different operational, but also demographic parameters, uh, such as uh, race, age, gender, uh, to, to name a few there. ICU outcomes specifically, uh, this one looked into uh, kind of beyond that step of who's going to the ICU, but how long are they been there? Uh, do they uh, leave the ICU uh, and then come back? Uh, do they always stay in the ICU the rest of their stay? And then do they actually require uh, a ventilator uh, for their care? And, and this was a, a critical thing for us to work on with our ICU staff 
uh, to give them that kind of context. I think a lot of uh, focus did go to the ICU um, throughout the pandemic. And two more, and then we'll get to the uh, dashboard and I realize I'm bumping up. Uh, so COVID testing, uh, similar uh, to our outcomes uh, dashboard, but really more focused on just the, the testing side of stuff, uh, looking at uh, whether or not we had uh, different rates of positivity, volumes, uh, who was getting tested, what uh, their test results were looking like uh, for us. Um, and, and this kind of helped uh, inform a little bit of what we were starting to see uh, within our community and the patients that we were treating. And the last one, flying through. This one's not on Tableau Public, uh, um, but I, like Luis mentioned, uh, we're now kind of at that point of looking at more at the vaccine data. Uh, this dashboard, not the flashiest thing in the world. Uh, at the top, there's just a quick KPI that's blurred out around our uh, vaccine volumes, and that's total. Uh, again, we're Pfizer uh, for what we're uh, providing. Um, so it's both, uh, this is counting first or second doses, and then it splits it up into first and second. And we look at different cohorts of patients to see uh, kind of what that um, vaccination rates have looked like, what the volumes are. Uh, for us, uh, and we have had to navigate um, through uh, changing guidance uh, from the state, from the federal, state, and then city level. Uh, for us, uh, the city of Chicago has its own uh, uh, public health department, uh, so they are often are navigating with the state health department, which is then working with the federal health department. Uh, so we would have different patient populations that we might kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, turn on for uh, being able to receive the vaccine. So we'd be able to monitor that um, over time as well. So with that, I'm going to very quickly uh, just show you one dashboard. Uh, and this is on the Tableau Public. Uh, if you don't have one, I would highly recommend getting a Tableau Public. It's a nice way to see what uh, not just organizations, but uh, uh, folks across the broader Tableau community are doing. Um, there's a lot of great uh, people out there. And if you don't know where to start, you can always also start with authors. There's usually featured authors um, that do really amazing things there. But our talk is data and analytics at UChicago. So uh, we will uh, focus on one. Uh, I'm going to actually go to the real-time status dashboard here. I'll hit view. Hopefully it doesn't take too, too long to load um, here. Uh, and you'll see there's disclaimers all over the place. Again, fake data, uh, not our data, not even close to our data, um, but the structure is what we use. Um, and this is not a real-time feed on Tableau Public, uh, so none of this data is gonna update. The MRNs are all fake. All of this data is fake. I wish it would load a little quicker, uh, but I'll talk while it's going. Um, we, we do have the disclaimers everywhere, uh, especially this kind of like light uh, big box here. Uh, if you wanted to actually look at it, you can just hide the vertical acknowledging that you saw the disclaimer uh, and then you can interact uh, with the data. Again, it's really kind of meant to show what would happen if you funneled your data into the report, uh, what you would see here. So you can see kind of our KPIs, uh, what our, uh, where our patients are at, um, what our testing volumes, and we are much, much higher than 90 um, now, but uh, it, it gives you kind of an idea of uh, what we're looking at. Uh, it always looks a little funky with fake data, but uh, the last thing that I'll add, uh, we also did add uh, kind of a collapsible container here. If you click this, oh, that should be go, that should be behind it. Um, if you click this, uh, you'll get kind of a quick text of what the dashboard is, how we went about it. And then uh, this was built pre the relationships uh, in Tableau. So it should be kind of how we join data together and what ta uh, tables were used. Um, so we were talking about the, uh, the tables we made, the views we made. Uh, there are a couple other things that we added in a little bit after the fact that weren't on that list. Um, but this uh, is kind of how we structured all of those dashboard starters. So really tried to help empower people uh, who are diving into this uh, to get the information they need if they want to run with it, if they want to recreate it with their own uh, uh, reports and, and their own data. So. With that, I will stop share, uh, and that'll wrap up our uh, presentation. Uh, just let me come off the uh, screen. Uh, brilliant. Okay, guys, thank you very much indeed. Um, I loved that. Uh, I loved a bit at the end, specifically where you have that um, the pop out showing how you put it all together. I think that's that's really nice. I, I like I've. 
I've not seen that before. So I, I, I like that. That's really, a really nice, uh, really nice detail. Um, OK, uh, I'm just going to have a look at the, the chat here. There was a question from uh, Andy Burns, uh, and he basically says, as someone who's new to Tableau, what was the differentiator with Tableau versus other products out there? Uh, Ella's replied basically saying ease of use, speed of implementation, flexibility, ability to connect uh, to any type of data source, and then goes on about uh, the uh, community support and, and that. Is, is there anything that you guys might be able to add to that for, for a new Tableau user as, as to you know what, what it is about it that you think makes it different from, from other products? So I know that uh, we specifically can't officially promote products uh, on behalf <laughs> of the organization. Uh, what I would say is as a new user, uh, be sure to connect with the community. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, really what helps me uh, get up and running, uh, whether that be through the Tableau conference or Tableau public. Um, there, there is a, 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 there are a lot of great people out there, yeah. uh, and that and you'll find uh, in that community. Yes, they might be Tableau users, but they might also use other products and can speak to why they use one or, or the other. Yeah. But um, there are some really truly great people out there. It's very true. I mean, one thing that struck me, like I'm with the information of what, about five years now or whatever, however long it is, I can't remember. Um, um, but <clears throat> the, one of the things that struck me was the, the community and the generosity of people. There's no um, sort of preciousness about There's two things. There's, nobody's precious about it. So it's not like, oh, well, I've studied this thing for five years, so you've got to do your time as well. It's not like that. You know, it's just, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the answer. Happy to share. It. They're happy to share. And the second thing, which I think is a big thing, is, is the uh, approachability. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Like nobody's going to scoff at you if it's, uh, you know, if, if you, you think it's a simple question because everybody had to start. So it's, it's, it's really like that, you know, that's, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of cool like that. I'm just going to have a look. There's two more questions come in here. Great presentation and fair play. Uh, this is from Owen for functioning at 5.30 in the morning. So say all of us. Um, Charles Cosgrave has a good question. Um, any ideas of veterinary based Tableau user groups in the US, Canada or the UK? That is an interesting question. Uh, does anybody know? I don't know, but I do know of somebody who had worked in a veterinary background and is now in a healthcare background. Okay. Uh, so uh, if Charles, if you wanted to email me or connect on LinkedIn, I might be able to connect with someone who would be my only guess uh, who would know. Uh, and that's not a promise that there is one, uh, but it's my only vet connect. There's a niche there, Charles, uh, yeah. for a new user group, a veterinary tableau user group. And I think you would probably get a lot yeah. of people interested in that, I have to say. Uh, he's responded to yeah. say, great, thank you very much. Um, and that's brilliant. Um, has anybody got any other questions? We're, we're, we're coming up to one o'clock now and uh, I'm conscious of, of the fact that Mark and Louis, Mark might want to go back to bed. Louise is, is just getting her day started. Kira and Sean, uh, can I ask how old are they? Yeah, so Kira is nine and Sean is four. Okay, <laughs> okay. Oh That's God, so you are you to are, school. Oh, they're, you're bringing them to school now. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, I well I hope you get a chance, both of you, to to, to catch up on 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 the rest of your day and and to to get some sleep. And I have to say, I, I'm I'm really so appreciative of the fact that you you know you got up so early and presented to us at this at this hour and I, I hope it didn't it wasn't too much of an imposition because it, it was it was a, a wonderful presentation as were all of the presentations uh, from Owen Terence uh, and Ella as well and um, so I, I'd like to thank uh, on behalf of the Tableau User Group Ireland I'd like to thank all of our contributors uh, for uh, for this particular user group it's it, it was uh, I had a specific you know sort of goal in mind uh, around you know showing how tableau can deliver um things that are actionable right and that in in the health space and i think you've all proven that okay and and so i i, I walk away from this anyway as, as a happy person and uh, and i hope uh, everybody else got something out of it um so look without further ado i will i will let you go and uh, i'll say thank you and uh, really appreciate your contributions. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks you. very much. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.
I'll close the door after everybody. So if you want to, if you want to go, that's great. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye. Take care.